Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning session uh, with uh, Naito Hitching on the Art Integral System. Okay. Well, thank you. So it's uh, it's been great having a meeting like this where uh, we're hearing new approaches, new viewpoints on something which uh, on the integrable system that I kind of stumbled upon over 35 years ago. So, but today I want to uh, talk about another object which I don't understand and I'm, I'm hoping to get some input on from uh, various uh, members of the audience because it's, uh, it's something which is there in the sense that the integral system is always there, but I don't know quite where it really sits in the landscape of the uh, geometry of uh, curves on a, on a uh, bundles on a, on a, a surface on a curve. Uh, now, I should apologize to the local members here because I gave a very similar talk in February here, and there hasn't been much progress since then, but uh, some of the slides are a bit different. So, okay, so um, let me begin. Let me begin just by, in a way, setting the, uh, the context. Uh, so, uh, in terms of Higgs bundles and the original integrable system, so we have uh, a curve C, so this is fixing notation if you like. E, my, e is now a vector bundle, the principal bundle. My Higgs field is trace zero, uh, endomorphisms twisted with a canonical bundle. And uh, with a stability condition, we get a moduli space. And in particular, if the Higgs field is zero, then the moduli space of stable bundles uh, sits inside this um, as a, uh, uh, Lagrangian uh, submanifold. And we can understand then at, at a point on this uh, moduli space of stable bundles, we can understand the space of Higgs fields as being the, on that particular vector bundle, as being the cotangent space at the point given by E on the moduli space of stable bundles. So uh, the integral system, so this is just for the linear group, uh, we look at the invariant polynomials, uh, which uh, is convenient here to have written trace of the powers. Uh, this gives us a proper map from the moduli space of Higgs bundles to a base, which is the vector space, the differentials of degree bigger than one. Uh, M is a holomorphic symplectic manifold. And so the dual space of the, uh, this vector space gives us uh, a lot of uh, functions. These are Poisson commuting functions. And uh, because the dimension is half the dimension of M, then this gives us a completely integral system. So this was, this was all uh, in, this, uh, in this original paper. So uh, let me just say now, since it's, uh, it involves a different language and it's gonna be, be kind of relevant to what I say later, why from my point of view, or at least all those years ago, why these functions pass on commute. So the picture there is the one which is based on this infinite dimensional uh, expression uh, of uh, the moduli space of, uh, of bundles uh, originating by with the chair and box. So the idea here coming from gauge theory is that you, you fix an underlying C infinity vector bundle. You fix if you like the topology of the vector bundle. And then you look at the affine space, infinite dimensional affine space of holomorphic structures on this and determined by D bar operators. So a D bar operator is something which, uh, which satisfies this relationship here. Uh, and this is an affine space. Uh, so the difference between two D bar operators is a zero one form with values in the endomorphisms of E. And on this, uh, this space, the group of uh, complex automorphisms, just C infinity complex automorphisms of the bundle uh, acts in a natural way, taking one D bar operator to another. And so now if we look, look at the uh, sections, C infinity sections of the uh, endomorphism bundle twisted with the canonical bundle, then we can understand that just by the natural pairing given by taking the trace and the integral over, over the curve C, we can understand that as formally speaking, the cotangent bundle of the, this affine space. So the difference is an affine space modeled on zero one forms. 
and the dual space are the one zero forms uh, with values in the same the algebra. So then, there's, uh, formally speaking, there's a, a symplectic form on this, just given by the pairing between the two uh, the two dual vector spaces. And the the key issue here is that, uh, in a formal sense, this is this is closed uh, because it's translation invariant. If you're in finite dimensions, you would say that this symplectic form has constant coefficients and is therefore closed. But it's it's essentially that translation invariance which tells you that it's, that it's closed in a formal sense. And so then if we have a, a zero one form with values in this bundle, we can pair it with this uh, trace of the uh, nth power of phi to give a one one form, which we can integrate over C. And this gives us a function on this uh, infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. If we have two such functions, then because they're patently independent of the actual holomorphic structure, like translation invariant in a way, then we can say that they, uh, they, if you like, in terms of symplectic geometry, they depend on just one set of, uh, of uh, coordinates, P, the P's or the Q's, if you like. And because of that, they are, uh, uh, they pass on commute. So the underlying idea is that somehow independence of this, the nonlinear aspects of this, namely the the, uh, the holomorphic structure, are um, uh, these things uh, don't affect these functions. So then uh, the formal picture is this: that if you look at the moment map for this infinite dimensional complex group with respect to the symplectic form, that turns out to be the d bar of phi. So the zero set of the moment map consists of the pairs where phi is holomorphic with respect to the given holomorphic structure. And then the, the function that I just wrote down is gauge invariant. We restrict it to this inverse image and it descends to M as a well-defined function on the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And when d bar phi is equal to zero, this function F only depends on the cohomology class, the Dolbo cohomology class of alpha. And that's the way we get our, our function. So, so basically the, uh, the Poisson commuting comes from this uh, translation invariance in this infinite dimensional picture. Of course, you make this rigorous by introducing metrics and taking slices and so forth, but that's, that's the, basic, the basic idea. So there's another way of, uh, of thinking of these, uh, this integral system uh, when we restrict to stable bundles. So most of what I'm gonna be talking about now are stable bundles. So we look at the, the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of stable bundles. This is a big, so the dense open set inside this moduli space of Higgs bundles. And then we can understand each one of these functions as being a, uh, a degree M homogeneous polynomial on each uh, cotangent uh, fiber. So another way of saying that is that this is a section of the symmetric power, uh, the nth symmetric power of the tangent bundle over this compact moduli space of uh, stable bundles. <clears throat> and uh, on symmetric uh, products, on symmetric tensors, there is a, a bracket which corresponds to the Poisson bracket on the cotangent bundle. So if we think of this symmetric tensor as a function on the cotangent bundle, then the Poisson bracket of two of these is equivalent to some kind of bracket on symmetric tensors. And this is a well-known bracket called the skelton nienhaus bracket. It's a bracket which extends the, the Lie bracket of two vector fields when M and N are equal to one, and it's just the, uh, the ordinary bracket of vector fields, the Lie bracket of vector fields. So this bracket, uh, one way of thinking of it is uh, if you think of the symmetric power uh, SMT, of some a section of that as being the symbol, the principal symbol of a holomorphic differential operator, then the principal symbol of the uh, commutator of two operators is this, is this, this bracket here. And that's, that's, of course, what goes into one version of quantization. Okay, so now, so that is one way of looking at the, what I would call the even integral system, the one that's been around all these years. And, uh, and it, but this is an interpretation in terms of the geometry of symmetric powers of the tangent bundle on the moduli space of stable bundles. 
So the odd one is, uh, is this. And instead of taking symmetric invariant polynomials on the Lie algebra, we look at uh, alternating invariant forms on the Lie algebra. In other words, we like generators of the cohomology of the, of the group. So if I have uh, uh, an alternating form of degree P on the Lie algebra, then I can evaluate that on P uh, Higgs fields and get a holomorphic section of the P's power of the canonical bundle. So the, the simplest example, and this is of course a uniform one, is if we, if we take the, the Cartan form, the Cartan three form, uh, which of course then up to some multiple on the, in the linear group is this trace of phi one bracket phi two phi three, then this gives us uh, cubic differentials. So just as if you like the, the, uh, the even quadratic, the even integral system, let's say for rank two gave us quadratic, uh, <clears throat> quadratic differentials, this gives us cubing differentials. Uh, so I wrote about this a few years ago um, in a conference uh, based on a paper, for a, a talk I gave at a conference in, in Hanover. And I gave a, a talk uh, last year, I had to give a talk last year in Hanover, and I, I thought, well, let me try and regenerate this idea since uh, nothing had happened since I'd uh, written it. And so that's, that's somehow the reason I'm bringing it for you today, because anyway, there's a great source of, uh, of expertise in the audience, and maybe they can enlighten me on certain points of this. So well, the, the proposition here is that these define commuting polyvector fields on the moduli space of stable bundles. So what, uh, what is a polyvector field? Uh, so this is a, a holomorphic section of the p-th exterior power of the tangent bundle. And there's a, there's a bracket on this. Uh, so this, I talked about this scout and nine house bracket with symmetric tensors being equivalent to the Poisson bracket functions on the cotangent bundle. So there's a skew symmetric version, uh, which has the same basic properties that uh, uh, the bracket of the something in the pth exterior power and the qth exterior power is in p plus q minus one. When p equals q equals one, it's the Lie bracket. And there's this uh, fundamental relationship that if you take the if you like the derivative of fb with respect to this bracket, then it's, it satisfies this. So now we're in the situation where A and B are sections of uh, exterior powers of the tangent bundle. So we can take the interior product with something which is in the cotangent bundle. So rather than the usual interior product of forms with vector fields, here we take interior product of polyvector fields with forms. So that's the kind of defining property. So the question is, uh, okay, so now why why do these commute? Well, it's ultimately the same kind of reason that I gave you for the ordinary integrable system. It's this translation invariance that you can reinterpret these things in the same way as being reductions from objects on this infinite dimensional affine space. These objects are translation invariant, and that's, that's the reason that they, they commute with respect to this, this bracket when we descend to the moduli space of stable bundles. So, uh, so, you, so here's, a, here's a particular point. So, I mean, there's a general point, which I'll return to later on, which is, well, how does this, does it relate in any way to the even integrable system, the one which we've all been talking about? And in rank two, uh, it does, because uh, of course the, the, the structure of the Lie algebra of SL2 is just of a, a three-dimensional space with an orthogonal uh, form. So this is rather like, uh, so the, and the, the bracket, if we, if we take the analogy with, you know, uh, undergraduate mathematics, that's like the vector cross product, trace of AB is like the dot product. We have this vector identity we all learned at university. And what it means in this context is that the, uh, I think I've got the coefficients right, that actually if we evaluate this uh, Cartan form for SL2 on three, uh, three Higgs fields, then we can actually uh, understand the value up to plus or minus one in terms of traces of <laughs> phi i phi j. And this is, this is part of the, the ordinary integral system. So this is a, 
a three by three matrix of quadratic differentials. And so the determinant of that is a, a, a section of the sixth canonical power of K, but it's, it's going to be actually the square of this one. So in rank two, uh, when rank, sorry, in, in uh, uh, well, okay, rank two as far as the vector one is concerned, not the group, then, uh, then there is a, a uh, direct relationship with the, uh, the other integral systems. But in higher rank, it's, uh, it's not, not, not so clear what's, what's going on. Uh, so the, the question that really arose was that, um, well, how do we, how should we interpret this? And um, this is the uh, this is what I mean by an odd symplectic manifold. This is one interpretation of uh, of this uh, commut commutativity property. It's one that uh, fits into a certain part of mathematics, but it's not it's not something which I I felt kind of solid enough to to pursue. But still, <laughs> what it's uh, what we can do is to think of the moduli space of stable bundles as a supermanifold. In other words, endow it with a sheaf of uh, the exterior algebras, namely the uh, O of the exterior power of the, of the tangent one. So in, in terms of supergeometry, this is a holomorphic supermanifold where the functions uh, are the uh, are sections of uh, you know, local functions, if you like, are sections of this sheaf. Uh, on the other hand, what we have here are some global functions. Our, our polyvector fields are actually global uh, functions on this, uh, this supermanifold in that sense. And then here's the interpretation of the Scouting bracket, that this is actually, or the property of the Scouting bracket, that it's a derivation of this uh, sheaf of exterior algebras. Um, so derivations of functions are basically vector fields. So we can think of that now these, these functions, uh, functions, these polyvector fields, if you think of those functions, they are functions which generate uh, vector fields in this context. So this is what, uh, what in, the, in the language of supergeometry you would call an odd symplectic manifold. These are, if you like, um, Hamiltonian functions uh, which commute in this in this, this context. So um, so that's a setting for this. It's a natural setting for what we've got, and it's analogous to the ordinary integral system. So which is where we have an ordinary, or if you like, an even symplectic manifold, and our symmetric functions give us uh, genuine functions on the on the cotangent bundle. So um, this is this is a language in which this, uh, this fact fits, but I haven't found it very, very productive. But one, what one can say is that these vector fields are actually in this context, they're, they're even. So the, at least if we take the generators, so the, of course the generators of the cohomology of the group are all in odd degree. And so what that means that these, uh, these vector fields actually, well, it involves one derivative. These are actually even vector fields in the, language of supergeometry, there's no component in the kind of vector field direction, in the spatial direction, if you like, of n. So you can basically exponentiate them uh, to, give, uh, to give automorphisms, a group, an abelian group of automorphisms of this sheaf of exterior algebras. So as I say, I came to a halt by, I mean, trying to find some context within supergeometry where all this made sense. The language is there, but I don't know where to where to proceed from that, uh, but uh, but there's another point of view which uh, I want to get onto in a minute. But before we do that, let me just uh, show you some examples. Um, and as usual, uh, at least with me, you start with the lowest possible example, genus two. Of course, in principle, I could put mark points and then look at projective space and so on, but. But uh, it, I always find it easier to start with the, the case where you don't have marked points or parabolic structures. So uh, curve of genus two, the hyperelliptic curve. Um, here are the cubic differentials. So our <clears throat> so for each 
So we're looking for, uh, okay, so we're looking for cubic differentials. So in this case, the moduli space is, uh, is only three dimensional. So this, this question about commutation is not an issue because our polyvector fields are all sections of the anti-canonical bundle. And of course the, uh, the bracket, the, the nine house bracket takes you into degree five, which is zero here. So, so actually the, uh, that's not an issue here, but it's still interesting to see what, uh, what we will get. So if we look at uh, the moduli space for rank two with trivial determinant, then this is well known a long time as being projective three space. And now the uh, anti-canonical bundle is O4. So the, of course, there are lots of uh, polyvector fields, of tri-vector fields on this. You know, any quartic uh, polynomial in four variables is going to give us one. Uh, but on the other hand, there's um, the ones that we're constructing this way are more restricted. And in particular, the, um, the hyperelliptic involution on the curve actually acts trivially on this moduli space. So that means that the, if we take the, the trace of, uh, we evaluate this degree three uh, invariant on three uh, Higgs fields, then we're going to get something, we're going to get a cubic uh, differential, which is invariant under y goes to minus y, and it's just a one dimensional space of those. So what we're looking for is a distinguished uh, quartic uh, polynomial in this uh, P3. And indeed there is one, well, you need to just do a calculation to see it's the right one. But the Kummer surface, if you look at the, uh, the, the equivalence classes of uh, direct sums of line bundles of degree zero, then this gives us a Kummer surface inside P3. And that's a, that's a quartic, singular quartic surface. And that's the corresponding uh, polyvector field in this case. Um, more interesting, okay, there's one remark here. And that is that uh, if we take uh, a vector bundle here, just still rank two degree trivial determinant, if we tensor by uh, a line bundle of order two, then this, is, this gives an action of uh, this finite group on the moduli space. And, uh, but what we're doing here, it all depends on the uh, endomorphism bundle B. And so that's insensitive to tensoring the, uh, the vector bundle by a line bundle. So what we can deduce from that, that these, these tri-vector fields, which are produced in this way from the Cartan three form are actually uh, invariant under this, this gamma action. Of course, I mean, I could have used that in the sense in P3, but there are still more uh, gamma invariant cortex than the, the one which gives you the, uh, gives you the Kuma surface. So in genus three, uh, we have a bit more information. Here, if we have trivial determinant bundle, then uh, of course this moduli space is actually singular. So that's not, not the main purpose, but still we can, we can look at this. So it's a aquatic hypersurface in, in P7. It's a, a six manifold, a singular six dimensional variety. And if you do the calculations here, you'll find that there's a, there are lots and lots of uh, tri-vector fields, degree three polyvector fields. On the other hand, if you cut them down to the gamma invariant ones, then it turns out that there are uh, 10, 10 dimensional space. And this is exactly 5G minus five, genus three. And so uh, these, uh, so what we can deduce, deduce if you like, is that these 10, uh, this 10 dimensional space of polyvector fields do commute. And in this case, commutation is non-trivial because we're in six dimensions. And the commutator of two tri-vector fields is at degree five. So, so the, the fact that these vanish is, uh, is non-trivial. Um, so there are two things to observe from this. One is that there may be more polyvector fields than uh, are produced in this way. That's not the case in the symmetric situation. So in the symmetric situation, we obtain uh, these symmetric, uh, and these uh, holomorphic sections of symmetric powers of the tangent bundle, they're all obtained by the integrable system. In this case, that's, that's not the case. Okay, so by putting to one side the, uh, the super geometry, I wanted to find out what, um, uh, what other context might one could put these polyvector fields in. And in particular, the, uh, the fact that we have uh, an action of this 
commutative group on this sheaf. So, uh, so the obvious thing is, uh, since, since the identical system gives us this commutative action on the sheaf, why not look at the action on the cohomology? So this is the tangential cohomology. It's the cohomology of the sheaf of sections of the exterior algebra of the tangent <coughs> number. And uh, really the underlying question about this talk is, what do we know about this, this space? I mean, we know all about the, let's assume for the moment that we're in, let's assume that we're in the smooth situation. We know what the ordinary cohomology is, we know about the, the relations, the multiplicative relations, we know about the, uh, the churn classes and so on and so forth. What about this kind of cohomology? How much do we know? And as far as I could see, that's very, very little, but I accept, you know, I've just produced you some polymorphic sections, some something in H0 of wedge three of T. So at least that's something. But the, the other thing which we know is in there, yeah, is the uh, H1 of the tangent sheaf, which is the, of course, the uh, infinitesimal deformations of the, of the complex structure, the Kadaira classes. And there we do know something from a uh, result of Narasimha and Ramanan that actually uh, they, you deform the, well, it's a very strong result they have, but of course, if you deform the complex structure on the curve, you deform the complex structure on the modular space of stable bundles, but that's, that's the only way that you can, you can do that. Of course, there's a, a much bigger picture that, uh, that the moduli space of, so the curve itself is a moduli space of certain bundles on, the, uh, on N, but never mind. Uh, this, this is the one fact that we can know. So, so, the, so we have an action of these uh, polyvector fields on this cohomology. So the first question we can ask is, what is the action on H1. Um, so we're looking at, so we have a, a holomorphic section here. The bracket uh, gives us, uh, we're looking at the bracket action on this, it takes us into this, this space here. So the question is, is that trivial or is it non-trivial? So this is just, uh, okay, another way of looking at it. Um, well, there are different ways of, uh, of looking at this. One of them is to, is to look at this the other way around. Uh, so if we think of it now as a, uh, the same bracket action, but now think of uh, H1 with values in tangent sheaf acting on the H0, then this has an interpretation, of course. If we, if we think of alpha as a Kodaira Spencer class for a deformation of complex structure of the modernized space, then this bracket is the, uh, the first obstruction to extending this polyvector field. On the other hand, these, uh, these polyvector fields were defined by an invariant process, which is independent of the complex structure on the curve. And so these, these, these always extend, they exist on every complex structure. So that bracket is equal to zero because these are, these are produced in an invariant way. It's possible that for some complex structures, there are more polyvector fields than ones given by this, and they, they may not deform, but certainly these, they certainly do uh, stay that they deform under deformation, and therefore this bracket is equal to zero. So at this point, um, if we're asking the question about does this commutative group, how does it act on the cohomology, on this tangential cohomology, then it's, uh, it's useful to look at the symmetric version of this, just as a, a point of comparison. So we could do the same thing. We could look at the the cohomology of the symmetric powers of the tangent sheaf instead of the exterior powers. Uh, it doesn't have, well, it has, it has algebraic properties, of course, but there's a way here in which uh, the Higgs bundle modulized space plays a role. So you know, we can think of, uh, say, a class here in this HQ, and we can evaluate these, uh, this symmetric power on the tangent bundle on the cotangent bundle. So it lifts to a, uh, something in HQ of the cotangent bundle of N, the values in the sheaf O, but which is, has the other property that it's homogeneous under the C star action, which rescales in the tangent direction. Uh, it rescales uh, in a degree, degree P. So then uh, by uh, some form of Hartog's theorem, if the co-dimension is correct, 
then this is the question about whether the this is the co-dimension of the semi-stable vector bundles inside the modularized space of stable Higgs bundles. If that is big enough, then you can extend that to the full uh, modularized space. And then uh, if, we, if we just look at the uh, H1 of T, which we were looking at in the, in the skew symmetry case, then you can uh, look at, use the integrable system. You can look at this H1 of MO, you can restrict it to the fibers, and uh, you look at the array spectral sequence, and effectively the, the fact that the translations, if you like, in this case, the group is generated by these, uh, these uh, Hamiltonian vector fields. These act as translations on each of the abelian varieties in the vibration. And uh, translation in, uh, in H1 of an abelian variety acts trivially on the cohomology. And so in this case, you can deduce a, a trivial action on the, on the tangent sheet. You could do it the same way as before in terms of the deformation theory. But this has much more generality. In fact, let me just jump down to the to this uh, result of uh, Franco and Telemann, that if you use the stack, you can forget about that uh, co-dimension argument. And what they prove is that actually the, the cohomology on the stack of, uh, is of the, this, these symmetric uh, things is actually, you can understand this by this direct image in terms of the algebraic exterior forms on, on, on the base, on the base. I use B instead of A for this base. And so, so, but the upshot of that is that the, uh, there's, a, there's a trivial action in this case, if you like, at least on the stack level, there's a completely trivial action. These, these, uh, these vector fields act trivially uh, by bracket operation on this uh, symmetric uh, cohomology. So that, if we go back now, so the question is, well, given, the, given this, uh, what we know about the symmetric version, uh, what do we know about the, you know, can we deduce something similar for this, um, this odd integrable system? And then we come up against the problem of this. So what is, what is this, this cohomology? I mean, all I've done is, uh, all we've proved so far is that there is a trivial action on part of this, the only part that we know at the moment, which is uh, the uh, H0, uh, at least the H0 coming from these, Poly, poly vector fields from the invariant forms and, and H1. And obviously we can take exterior products, uh, so we can take products in this cohomology. And so you can have a trigger action on some of that. But the underlying uh, question is what is for now, what is this for me at least, is what is this? This is, you know, it seems like we knew everything, we knew everything about the modernized space of stable bundles, but this is one invariant that, as far as I know, we know very little about. And so uh, let, me, uh, let me say what, as, as far as I've been able to determine, what we know about this, uh, this cohomology. Well, first of all, this is a Fano manifold. Again, let's assume that we're in the smooth situation. So the first churn class is positive. And so we can use vanishing theorems uh, and uh, duality to show that uh, actually when P is less than Q, this, uh, this is equal to zero. So H1 of T is just, just on the edge of this, you know, this vanishing. So indeed, when we, if we multiply elements in H1 of T by themselves, then we get uh, terms of type PP, that's again, just on the edge of the vanishing. Yeah. Um, what else do we know? Well, uh, we have like, if we look at the top exterior power, so if we look at the anti-canonical bundle, then of course, this is, uh, this is a line bundle over the uh, modularized space of stable bundles. We have uh, exact formulas. We have the Felinda formula for holomorphic sections of that. So this is, this is just rank two, okay? So this is rank two. So the top, the uh, dimension of N is three G minus three. This is the top exterior power. And so the Belinda formula gives us uh, this. And uh, if you look at the gamma invariant part of this, and there's the Belinda formula gives you this. So, so at the very least, what we can say here is that, uh, that this type of cohomology is acted on non-trivially by, by gamma. So the, the ordinary cohomology of modernized space of stable bundles 
as trivial gamma action, but here, here we can see certainly this top degree part, but it's, uh, it's non-trivial. Okay, what else do we know? Well, uh, Narasimhan and Ramanan showed that there are no holomorphic vector fields, uh, at least apart from P3, basically. And uh, as we've seen that the H1 is uh, 3G minus three dimension, it's isomorphic to the deformations as they occur. And in the paper I wrote, uh, which introduced these objects, uh, there, are, there are only two theorems in it. One is that the, the map from the dual space of the cubic differentials in rank, in, well, in arbitrary rank actually, is injective uh, for genus greater than two. So we know that, so we saw already that in genus two, uh, this could be smaller than, uh, than five dimensional. Um, but also there's vanishing theorem here for bivector fields. So that uh, uh, <clears throat> at least that's, that's something. So the, the tri-vector fields, so the, the degree three polyvector fields are the first ones, which, so there are no, none of degree one, none of degree two, and uh, there are some clearly of degree three. So that's, that's the start. And here's an example of this uh, cohomology. So this is only a, this is a three-dimensional version. So this is where we look at uh, genus two of odd degree fixed, fixed uh, determinant. The moduli space is intersection of two quadrics in P5. Uh, this, is the, this is the picture for HQP. Here is H1 for the tangent sheaf, the three dimensional space of sections of the uh, uh, anti, well, it's BMP, you know, quadratic differentials. Uh, here, as, here you do get some my vector fields, so degree two. Um, and here we get 19 uh, sections of this third exterior power. But uh, of course, these, if you take the, you can take the bracket of some, Something of degree two, you can take the bracket with itself. In fact, if you if you want to understand whether you're getting a Poisson manifold, then you, then you need to know whether sigma bracket sigma is equal to zero. So, so for example, for each of these fifteen um, bivector fields, you can take the bracket with themselves and get some trivector fields here. So, if that if I I didn't work it out, but if I assume that that gives you the fifteen inside here, there are four extra ones. And the four extra ones come from the anti-invariant uh, cubic differentials on the uh, on the curve. So in this case, the actual uh, the involution acts non-trivially on this moduli space. So so four of these are represented by these uh, these polyvector fields in this way. The the general picture, well, you know, the vanishing theorem is, is tells you that all of this is equal to zero. So there's a it's like a Hodge parallelogram instead of a Hodge diamond in this case. Uh, okay, so, so the, the place that I decided was the right place to look as far as this, uh, this picture is concerned is in terms of the Hochschild cohomology of the moduli space of stable bundles. I have to say that I, I'm only learning about this now, but I, what have I done? I've kind of come at it we're looking at this cohomology of polyvector fields. So, um, and what I'm using is, if you like, the fact that uh, we have this uh, Hochschild Kosten Rosenberg isomorphism between the cohomology of the space of polyvector fields and the, this uh, Hochschild cohomology. Now, this is uh, an isomorphism as vector spaces. But uh, not as algebras unless we take the product with the square root of the top uh, top polynomial. So, so what we've got here is uh, a lot of uh, so one one forms, two two forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the formal square root of that gives you something like this. So for each of these uh, PP forms, we can act on this uh, HQ with uh, HP coefficients by, if you like, contracting on the uh, okay, well, it's a, contra a contraction. You, <laughs> if you like, if it's a if it's a KK form, you you go into HQ plus K wedge P minus K because you contract with the the K form on the wedge P T factor, and then you multiply on the on the Q factor. So uh, so this is a way of uh, of relating uh, 
these uh, this geometry, this all these this space that we this cosmology that we really don't know very much about, with something which is uh, uh, perhaps more interesting in terms of the moduli space of uh, of stable bundles. Uh, because the uh, the Hochschild cohomology is an invariant of the derived category, and so possibly we can make use of the derived category uh, information about the derived category of the moduli space and stable bundles. So, but all we know, of course, at the moment is is very little about uh, either of these things. Uh, but in particular, the HH two is the, consists of the first order deformations of the uh, derived uh, category, and we do know something about that. So, so we know that, uh, this is in rank two, that uh, we said that there's no, there are no holomorphic sections of the second exterior power, and we know that we understand what H1 of the T is. So what that, what that means is that uh, also that H2O is equal to zero because this is a finer variety. And so what we know is that as far as the moduli space of stable bundles is concerned, HH2 is equal to this. So all the deformations of the uh, infinitesimal deformations of the uh, derived category come from deformations of the complex structure of N, which in turn come from deformations of the complex structure of, of C. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, some uh, conjectural it's still, I think, conjectural, almost, it's almost there, I think. Uh, there's this uh, Narasimhan conjecture about the derived category, which uh, says that there's a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition in terms of uh, derived categories of symmetric powers of the, of the curve, symmetric products of the curve. So as far as I understand, this is not quite proved, but this paper shows that uh, all of these things are there, but there might be another uh, component which is orthogonal to all of them. So I think the last time I checked, they still weren't sure whether that's, that's complete. So, but <clears throat> the point is that there is, so the derived category certainly contains the, these, within a semi-orthogonal decomposition, these, um, these, uh, derived categories of the uh, symmetric uh, products. So can we use that? Um, well, again, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert in these things, that when you have a semi-orthogonal decomposition, then there's a kind of exact, there's an exact, exact sequence, a kind of Maya Torres sequence for, um, for the Hochschild cohomology. And so in particular, if we take uh, C, G minus one or any any of the, the powers, the symmetric powers below that, then there's a, a, a kind of restriction map from the uh, Hochschild cohomology of N to this. And so in, in particular, there's a, a map, uh, at least as far as the linear is concerned to the, uh, <laughs> from this, I mean, may not preserve degrees, but there's a map uh, which goes, uh, goes like this. So. So that leads to the question about if we're really lacking information about modulus, about the cohomology, this tangential cohomology for N, can we learn about this from the tangential cohomology of symmetric powers? So what is in the exercise sequence P1, P2? Uh, yes, that's <coughs> right. That's something to do with, I mean, exactly. I don't understand that, probably, what those things are, because uh, that's important. Uh, because in fact the uh, yeah so so this this doesn't have any polyvector fields so uh, you know in terms of this uh, where do they where do these elements in HH three come from in terms of this decomposition that, that I don't understand at all but, uh, um, so I'm a, a beginner when it comes to this so uh, but what what do we know about this uh, tangential cohomology for the symmetric mm -hmm. products. Well, the ordinary cohomology, of course, was determined a long time ago, but in particular, there are lots of holomorphic forms on uh, symmetric products. And so that means that there aren't any sections of that. I mean, if you have a section of the p theory power, the tangent bundle, 
evaluate any of these forms on that to get a, a function which is a constant or zero. So we have uh, we have uh, nothing there. Uh, there's this result of Kempf and, uh, and a later ver a version by Pantin, which uh, shows that actually just like um, moduli space of stable bundles, uh, first order deformations are just de uh, determined by first order deformations of the uh, of the curve. And uh, there's a, a bit more. So, so here's the here's the picture. When it comes to HH two, so this is the this is the only place where we really have information. Um, so what do we have? So for the symmetric product, we have this. So we do have these uh, this deformations by flat gerb. So you twist twist by a flat gerb. That's the you can do that in the symmetric product. You can't do it on the modular space of stable bundles. Uh, but as far as uh, okay for genus greater than four, then uh, then what we know is that for stable bundles, as I mentioned before, HH two is just deformations of the of the curve. So there's uh, there's a map then from HH two of n to HH two of cn, and uh, so deformations of the of n go into well they go into direct sum here. But so I don't know whether there's a there might be a component here. I suspect not. It seems reasonable to assume that at least the, the map from here to here is actually an, iso, an isomorphism. There's a natural deformation on either side, which comes from the deformation of the curve. It surely has to has to correspond there. So in principle, uh, unless you do the calculation, there might be you might actually under this map there might be a, a deformation of the under a gerb, but it sounds unlike. So what I want to do is do something rather primitive first, and then ask lots of questions. So the primitive thing is to is to use this to show that, that there are some extra pieces in this uh, tangential cohomology of the modernized space of stable bundles. In other words, if we that, uh, that there are um, elements in uh, PP elements which in fact arise from H1 of the, of the tangent sheet. So this is kind of an uh, important point here that, uh, so this symmetric power in this decomposition, it, it terminates at G at uh, G minus one. So you might ask, well, uh, well, why is that? Well, I think it's okay. It's a good reason for that. But in terms of this, uh, this uh, tangential cohomology, uh, if we go right to the top, if we look at the anti-canonical bundle, then the uh, the higher cohomology of that is equal to zero because this is a Fano manifold. So at some stage, uh, so what I'm saying here is that uh, at some stage this HP wedge PT terminates, uh, but it's that stage is beyond uh, G minus one. So, so the argument is, so I'm, I'll just give you a sketch of the argument. Anyway, the idea is that uh, we have this map here. We take uh, P elements uh, in here, and we take that product in uh, over here. This gives us HP, which PT. And now this uh, square root of Todd acts trivially on this because it takes, it raises this and it lowers this and uh, and that's, uh, that, that, that vanishes. And so the vanishing theorem tells us that uh, that part is zero. So actually, the, uh, if we're, this root, uh, root tard acts trivially on, on this. And so, so this product uh, goes in, if, if this product is zero uh, in, the, in the cohomology of N, then the corresponding uh, uh, terms in the, uh, in the Hofschild cohomology of CCP are equal to zero. Uh, to be honest, that's not the big issue, but it's anyway, it's, it's here. So then uh, what you can do is you can take uh, some special types of uh, deformations or uh, elements in H1 of a tangent sheaf. So if you take, um, say if you take a local deformation, take a punctured disc around a point in the curve and look at this, uh, homomorphic vector field uh, in a punctured neighborhood, and then this gives us uh, an element in the H1 of the uh, tangent sheaf. Uh, 
it's basically, if we look at said duality, it's basically the evaluation map for a quadratic differential. So the, the residue, you evaluate a quadratic differential on that, it's basically the residue. So it gives you the, the value of that quadratic differential at that point. Uh, so uh, so now let me just draw some pictures. So, so if we take the, uh, the symmetric product uh, of degree two, so this is taking the product and dividing out by the involution, then we, what we know is that the uh, H1 of this corresponds to this. So uh, what we can do is that we can take a, a representative. So here, if you like, so the point about this, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that you could take a Dolbo re representative for this class in H1 of K star, which is supported in a neighborhood of that point, locally supported. Uh, so if you look at the corresponding element in uh, H1 of the symmetric product, it's something which is supported on the image of uh, P times C under this projection onto the quotient. So it's supported in a neighborhood of this, this curve here. So now if you take, so this is the image of the diagonal in C cross C. So now if you take a, another point, then this, uh, this Dolbo class is supported in the neighborhood of that. So the, the product in here, is supported in a, a neighborhood of the intersection P plus Q. And now if you want to see whether that's non-zero or not, you can evaluate uh, by said duality sections of, uh, of K squared of C2, and there are lots and lots of those. So you can see that uh, generically, you can, you're certainly going to get a non-zero non -zero value. So these particular classes, if you multiply them together, they give you something non-zero for the symmetric product, and therefore they should give you something non-zero in, in, uh, in itself. Anyway, there's a more, okay, you can look at that in more generality. So that's just a way of, uh, of kind of producing elements inside this, this, uh, this tangential cohomology and correspondingly in the Hochschild cohomology from, from just all we know, basically, in terms of deformation theory. So that leads to all sorts of questions. So, uh, so let, I'm going to finish up with lots of questions. So the first one is, uh, is this I mentioned before, where does this terminate? Is it, uh, does it actually vanish uh, if P is greater than or equal to G? I rather suspect that's true. Right? We know that it vanishes right at the, at the top, but it's, it's conceivable to me that this, this is true about it. And also, um, the elements in here that I constructed were all given by taking products of elements in this uh, 3G minus three dimensional space that we've got here. Uh, so is that all we get in any case? Uh, I don't know. Um, first, also, what about these uh, 5G minus five holomorphic sections? Is this all, all of them? Well, I suspect this is not. The example I gave was the, uh, a singular space. It was a low, low genus and it was singular. It wasn't this smooth space. Um, but in, in general, I would expect that there are probably more holomorphic sections than, than the ones occurring in this way. Uh, well, but the ones that occur in the way I've given are, are commuting. So maybe it's all these maximal commuting uh, subspace. Or more generally, um, of course, in the the usual integrable system, uh, we could say that this was a completely integrable system because of dimension results. That if you have a 2G, a 2N dimensional symplectic manifold and you have N functionally independent commuting functions, then that's, that's maximal. As far as these, this kind of odd system is concerned, I don't know, even without looking at this as a, a particular example, just in general, is there a, a limit to the, the number of uh, holomorphic uh, commuting uh, uh, tri-vector fields on any given manifold? I don't know. Um, there's also a question about are they, uh, are they determined, are they the ones which are gamma invariant? We've kind of seen that, again, in the low genus uh, non-smooth case, that, that, that there are more than there are given, uh, than there are more gamma invariant ones than, sorry, there are more than the ones which are gamma invariant. 
Uh, so those are all sorts of uh, questions. There's, there's this one here, which is uh, more related to uh, to this um, semi-orthogonal decomposition. Um, so symmetric products of the curve occur in uh, the work that we were doing with Tamash, which you've been hearing about. So I just want to point out here uh, something which is uh, still, I don't know whether this is relevant or not, but in order to uh, embed the derived category of the symmetric product in here, we need a, a, a Poincaré sheaf over, over the product. As far as I know, this is given by, we take the universal bundle over C cross N and we look at the corresponding uh, universal bundle on the, on the on here. So this, this is the one where you, you pull back and push down to get the relationship between the two derived categories. On the other hand, this is this occurs in uh, in Tamash's work. So this uh, this universal bundle here is is defined on the Higgs bundle moduli space. We take n points, and then this bundle is defined on the the Higgs bundle moduli space. So the n points appear appear as fixed points of uh, uh, in terms of fixed points of a uh, um, an action uh, on the uh, uh, on the fix on the Higgs bundle moduli space, and so and the mirror of the upward flow uh, is actually um, is actually a vector bundle, which is a hyperholomorphic bundle. So in a sense, this bundle restricted to the to the moduli space of stable bundles is this hyperholomorphic bundle restricted to the to the moduli space of stable bundles rather than the, uh, the, the section, which is the sort of thing that, uh, that I was doing with, with Tamas. Anyway, that's, that's the kind of side issue about, about how you embed CN in, 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 inside this uh, derived category. And then the final question is, is this, how, how does this relate to the ordinary even integrable system? So I, I told you how in some sense in rank two, you can, you can uh, Apart from taking square roots, you can you can kind of relate the two. But uh, I know I really know very little about this. Here is here is here are a, few, here are a couple of ideas. So um, if we look at the generic fiber in the integral system, so this is a prim variety, the spectral curve over the uh, original curve. Then if we intersect this with the cotangent bundle of the uh, moduli space of stable bundles, then this is, we're remo removing something of co-dimension, generically a co-dimension greater than equal to G from this abelian variety. So now if we, if we take a, a polyvector field on N and then think of it this way as a, a form, an N minus Q form with values in the anti-canonical bundle, then we can, Pull that back from n, so we have a map from projection from a minus u to n. We can pull it back to uh, to a a minus u uh, and get a and then go back to the tangent uh, sheaf by using the the corresponding uh, relationship in uh, in the abelian variety. And so, but then we get a twist by the, uh, the pullback of the anti-canonical bundle. On the other hand, uh, we know what this, this is in terms of the dealing variety. It's, uh, it's actually some multiple of the uh, restriction of the theta line bundle from the abelian variety of, uh, from the Jacobian of, of S. So this is, a, this is a, an identifiable bundle on the abelian variety A. We have a section, this is the tangent sheet of, uh, of A. And so if the co-dimension is uh, what I've been with G, then we can extend that as a section of that. So, so these uh, polyvector fields do exist from the abelian varieties, but they, they become, uh, if you like, uh, well, if you put it this way, you could say, if we use the ramification divisor, uh, then we can divide by that. And what we get are, if you like, uh, meromorphic polyvector fields, which, which can be, so there's some, uh, so they do, on each, I'm just looking at an individual fiber here. So these objects do exist on the uh, on the abelian variety, and the fact that they commute are some uh, differential equations for the for the coefficients. Of course, the 
you can express things in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, constant uh, vector fields on A, which always commute. So every, everything comes down to some uh, derivatives of the uh, of the coefficients, some uh, well, ratios of theta functions. So integrability, if you like, uh, imposes some conditions on, you know, on these objects. But the other thing that you can do is, is actually, if you would take the, the tautological one form on uh, the cotangent bundle, then you could take its interior product with the, one of these uh, body vector fields. And then because uh, A is Lagrangian, you're taking the, the inner product, uh, well, properties of this uh, scout and bracket tell you that actually, knowing that these commute, then you get a further relation here. So mm -hmm. here you have some meromorphic bivector field, meromorphic uh, trivector field, you get some relations like this. So, so there are, there's a whole lot of geometry somehow on each of these abelian varieties, which reflects in some way uh, this commuting property, but I have no idea what to do with it. Uh, and I'm clearly no idea how this relates to the uh, effect of this, uh, this, these objects and the, the Hochschild cohomology. So I think there are lots of open questions there. One being, we know very little about this Hochschild cohomology from modulized space of state of volumes. The other is, uh, what is really the role of these, uh, these commuting uh, objects? Uh, is it really that one should go back to the supermanifold context and understand that better? Or should we should we think more about this uh, this uh, Hochschild cohomology? So that's lots of questions, but it's just the point where I should finish. Thank you. Question? Well, how your manifold? There is this paper by Baranikov on Sebi for the Transurbanian structure on the cohomology polyvector. So here you have a fan of money, but I wonder if there is something in the literature already about, I mean, using mirror symmetry for anything, what is this? Uh, well, uh, imposing mirror symmetry on the Fano is uh, Landau Ginsburg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. Um, oh, I, no, uh, of course, you know, for Falabi yeah, you know, you, I, okay, this is Kalabi Yao, not hypercalic, but well, for Kalabi Yao, you can relate Cotangent vectors to tangent vectors as well. So, the, so the, uh, there's a direct relationship with the cohomology rather than, I mean, this tangential cohomology becomes, apart from different gradings, becomes the ordinary uh, PQ uh, cohomology. Um, one thing I should say is that uh, this action, as far as I can see, uh, the action does commute with square root of the Todd genus. I mean, you know. The action may well be trivial, in which case, for what, you know, nothing. <laughs> but at least in first principles, uh, the, uh, at least in rank two, uh, we know that, this, uh, that the action of the first chunk pass and the second chunk pass does commute with this, with this action. Uh, so so the, there should be an action of this uh, abelian group on the, on the Hochschild cohomology, whatever, whatever that is. Any other question? I have a question. Um, you want to relate to the usual integral system, but um, uh, in a related direction. Uh, do you think there is any relation to invariant theory, maybe in the context of super manifolds, if such a thing exists? Oh, that's that's where half the audience might have some ideas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, no, no, it's uh, it, it's true. Once you possibly, if you ab abstract everything back, but the thing is that we've I don't know, we've maybe lost the role of this the abelian variety, other than this this mm. property here. Um, yeah, I would hope so. I would hope there's a more general context, perhaps in the language of supergeometry, mm. where this becomes more more obvious, and that the the role of the curve is. Uh, this kind of goes into the background and the, mm. the actual, because it's so universal that there is a universal picture where the curve takes a very much smaller role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so much.
are there. Probably not because you know about them, but I, I still ask you that. Are there. Uh, uh, I, uh, Mix and a lot of um, uh, Clara Simon's conjecture and give me one of the assets. There are other uh, Higgs and a lot. So oh, Higgs and a lot. Clara Simon. Yeah, I don't, and then I don't know. The derived category in the DSMN. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a newcomer, a novice at this, but uh, that's a good question. I, I have no idea. Um, no, I, I, I mean, you'd like to put the equivariance in as well, presumably. Yeah. 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 Not sure, not sure. But, uh, but that's a good point. That yes. Maybe, maybe it's, it might be interesting to study. Oh, no, well, of course, if you study the straightforward, uh, if you like, tangential cohomology of a hypercalar manifold, then you can, you can relate it to the ordinary cohomology. But, whether, but on the other hand, this is a non-compact manifold. And so things that are simply imposing C star action to get it down to finite dimensions is probably not the right thing to do there. It's, yeah, it's a good, good question. Well, since we have 